At that time, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and he was transfigured before them. Words from today's Holy Gospel, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Sometime after, St. John Bosco had established his home for wayward boys in Turin, his own dear and saintly mother, Margaret, who worked with him in keeping these little urchins properly fed and clothed, came to his office one day, crying out, I can't do this anymore. You ever felt like that? I can't do this anymore. You see all the trouble I take, and yet nothing comes of it. Can't stand these boys. Today I find all the washing I had hung up trampled on the ground. Yesterday they ran over all my vegetable garden. Some come back at night with their clothes all in rags. Others without neckties or shoes or handkerchiefs. Some of them hide their shirts. Others take my saucepans to play with. Takes hours to find all these things. I have had enough of it. I tell you, I have had enough of it. I can't go on any longer. And just think how quiet I was at home in Betchy, doing my spinning. Let me go back to in my days there. Don Bosco's only reply was to point to the crucifix hanging on the wall. Mother Margaret understood and her eyes filled with tears. And she said, you are right, you are right. And then went down and put on her apron. Last Sunday, we learned this lesson from the Desert Fathers. Demons, devils, cannot easily find an entrance into the mind, the heart, or the body of anyone, nor have they the power of overwhelming the soul of anyone, unless they have first deprived it of all holy thoughts and made it empty and free from spiritual meditation. Underline those words, spiritual meditation. That's how the devils get in. We don't meditate. We don't have holy thoughts. We're tempted. And so the Desert Fathers always stress the need for meditation and overcoming the devil in all his wiles. How much more is this true today with the rising tide of the occult in our world? We need this. Wicca is now the fourth largest religion in America. Wicca, witchcraft. According to the fathers, the doctors and the saints, Christian meditation, most especially focused on the passion of our Lord and Savior, has proven to be the most powerful in keeping the devil away and breaking free from sin. This is one reason why we arrive on Mount Tabor to the Transfiguration on this second Sunday of Lent. Ever feel like you've had enough? Maybe you've already feel that way. You're feeling the pinch of your Lenten resolutions? I hope so. It's a good sign you chose well. But maybe you're thinking, I've had enough of this. Just like that saintly mother of John Bosco. But notice in the Gospel today that all the people involved starting with His Majesty, our Lord Himself, the Apostles Peter, James, and John, as well as Moses and Elias. They all, each and every one of them, did something wonderful for God. They did outstanding things for God and for man. They performed heroic feats, and they're still remembered today. Our Lord is adored. He's loved. He's imitated. That's why we're here today at Mass. And these, his saints, are greatly honored. Their names are a blessing. The Lord is the Savior of the world, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Peter and Paul are the princes of the apostles. James and John, the beloved disciple. They're among the foundation stones of the church. John is the eagle. 
Elias is among the greatest of the prophets, a man chosen to prefigure his majesty's ascension into heaven by his being taken up in a fiery chariot. A man who has still not died. He has not died. But will come back at the end to fight the Antichrist. And he is the Holy Father of Carmel. Moses went before the burning bush, brought down the ten plagues upon Egypt, split the Red Sea and brought the Israelites out of Egypt and gave them the law. How did they do it? One could say that they, each of them, meditated on the passion of Christ. That's how they did it, according to their time, place and position. That's what gave them the strength to do these great things. In St. Luke's recounting of the transfiguration, he mentions how our Lord and his chosen disciples went up into a mountain to pray, to pray. Hmm. And as they prayed, behold, two men were talking with him and they were Moses and Elias appearing in majesty. And they spoke of his decease in Latin, ex chasum, his departure, his death that he should accomplish in Jerusalem. That's what they were meditating on up there. They were talking about the passion. Obviously, these two great ones, Moses and Elias, were meditating with our Lord on his passion before he'd entered into it. Hint, hint. We need to be doing the same. Now, it seems to me that these two Old Testament figures were chosen not only because they represent the law and the prophets, not just because they had intimately discussed various things with God in times past on his mountain, just as they're doing now on Mount Tabor, but also because they shared in his passion by prefiguring it in their very own lives and in their very persons. They knew something about suffering. They knew something about being crucified. Moses experienced rejection, even betrayal by his own brother and sister. And what of all the trials and sufferings of bringing the stiff-necked and hard-hearted Israelites out of Egypt? He held his arms in the shape of a cross on the mountain as Joshua fought the Amalekites down in the valley always holding the staff of wood in his hand, which represents the cross. He made the bronze serpent, placed it on a tree, which is a crucifix. I prefigured the crucifix. He offered the Passover lamb, which was roasted on a spit in the shape of a cross. Prefiguring Holy Communion. And there are many, many more such things, all of which are so many types, prefigurements, of our Lord's exodus, his exchasum, his departure from this world, soon to be accomplished on that other higher mountain, Mount Calvary. We can also note when he failed, that is, if you remember the story, Moses struck the rock a second time. This too touched intimately upon the passion of the Savior, Because he is the rock. Christ is the rock, as St. Paul teaches us. It followed the, the Israelites to the desert. It was struck only once and out came water and life. But this rock was struck again. It can only be struck once. But Moses disobeyed God when he was supposed to speak to the rock. He struck it again and it didn't do anything, so he struck it a third time. What is that? Why is that wrong? He failed to realize that that was a type, a type of Christ who can only be struck once with a sword or a spear. And out comes the church, which can only be one church born from the side of Christ. He cannot be pierced again. And so he failed in properly prefiguring Christ and his church. And therefore, he could not enter the promised land. That is, until the Savior himself came and brought him in. How about Elias? Well, he too experienced rejection from King Achab and the people. He ate the bread of angels below a tree in the desert. That's the cross. 
He was served by angels, just as our Lord was in the desert. He was hunted down and nearly killed for speaking the truth and doing good. And many more such things did he. Both of them, therefore, certainly merited the reward of seeing and conversing with our blessed Lord about his passion on that other mountain, Mount Tabor. They knew something about it. They had lived the passion in their very own lives. Through their witness alone, we see what meditating on the passion can do. Namely, open a pathway for us to talk openly and plainly with our God about his mysteries. Maybe we're looking for the fantastic, huh? Some wonderful intervention of God in this most difficult time. St. Elias had that intervention on Mount Carmel against the 450 false prophets of Baal. Yet he still had to flee and embrace a heavy cross. Because he embraced it, he is then able to speak intimately to his majesty about his passion, death, and resurrection to be accomplished in Jerusalem. Someday he too will embrace the same passion. He will be put to death but yet rise up and go into heaven, body and soul, on the third day, victorious. You can read about it in the Apocalypse, chapter 11. This is a grace, and he knows it. So what is being taught here? But that Calvary is the greatest display of God's power in vanquishing evil. And it demands our attention it demands our devotion and frequent meditation. If we are to share in the fruits that it offers, if we are to produce fruits ourselves, this needs to be done. In hoc signo vinces, in this sign you shall conquer. In all three synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the transfiguration follows upon the giving of the keys to St. Peter. Recall what our Lord said to the apostles immediately after making Peter the rock on which he would build his holy Catholic church. He said to the disciples, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the ancients and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And the third day rise again. What then happened? Remember the story? Peter then pulled his majesty aside to rebuke him, saying, Lord, be it far from thee. This shall not be unto thee. No. Then our Lord turned to the first pope and said those shocking words. Go behind me, Satan. Thou art a scandal unto me, because thou savorest not the things that are of God, but the things that are of men. What happened? Why did Peter make this mistake? It is just as simple as this. He refused to meditate upon the passion. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to know any more about it. No. And then he's called Satan. Just after the Last Supper, this same good-hearted Peter again made a plea to our Lord. Yea, though I should die with thee, I will not deny thee. As we all know, he denied our Lord thrice. On Mount Tabor, St. Peter, along with James and John, slept instead of joining in the meditation. And then were rebuked for wanting to stay up there by building three tents. When they finally came down the mountain, they found a crowd because the apostles of the Lord who remained at the bottom could not cast out a demon from a boy. He's making a scene. Why these failures? At least one reason. Again, they didn't meditate upon the passion. 
They knew not his power. This happened again on Mount Olivet when they slept in the garden instead of obeying their heavenly father who said so clear to them on Mount Tabor, this is my chosen son, listen to him. What did he say in the garden? He warned them, watch ye and pray that ye not enter to temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. In the garden on Mount Olivet, the disciples had a just attended the first mass in the upper room, received ordination and holy communion, and then they quickly fell away. What's the lesson? Again, what was lacking? This meditation on the passion. How many times did our Lord say, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's not easy to do. That's a hard commandment in some ways. So taking up our cross is best done alongside a frequent meditation on the passion in order to appreciate its value, its worth, its power, its necessity. Now, this can be done easily or rather easily through the stations of the cross said devoutly to the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary prayed with some care. Prayerfully reading the Passion accounts in the four Gospels. Or some good commentary on them, like from Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich or Venerable Mother Mary of Agreda. To see it from the eyes of Our Lady. We can also meditate on Isaiah's chapter 52, 53. Wisdom chapter 2, Psalm 21. They're all about the Passion. We know that St. Peter learned from his mistake, as his first letter indicates, namely, enduring the sufferings of this world patiently requires thinking on the passion. Thus, the first pope wrote, For unto this patient suffering are you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He's no longer Satan. Get behind me. Now, if you're not convinced, we finally have the words of St. Paul, where he is in tears because so many conduct themselves as enemies of the cross of Christ. It seems that St. Paul meditated on the passion so often that he could say, I bear the marks of the Lord Jesus in my body. And another place, he says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. Maybe we question in our hearts, who doesn't once in a while? Does God really love me? Will he fulfill his promises? When we meditate on the passion, we discover that he loves us enough to take on our mortality in order to suffer in every part of his body and his soul for us, even unto a most painful death. Oh, how much we are loved. Let us then make the cross the centerpiece of our prayer so that we will be climbing the right mountain, that of Calvary, instead of trying to set up worldly tents on Mount Tabor, where we will only make our belly our God and our minds be occupied with earthly things, where we will sleep instead of pray, such that our end will be destruction. No, let's join with Moses and Elias and pray with our Lord in heartfelt meditation, discussing with him his exodus that he accomplished in Jerusalem. Then the devil will be kept at bay and we will endure suffering patiently. Listen to the imitation of Christ. If you cannot contemplate high and heavenly things, Take refuge in the passion of Christ and love to dwell within his sacred wounds. For if you devoutly seek the wounds of Jesus and the precious marks of his passion, you will find great strength in all troubles. And if men or even devils despise you, 
you will care very little, having small regard for the words of your detractors. One last quote from the imitation of Christ that hits home. Sigh and grieve that thou art still so carnal and worldly, so unmortified from thy passions, so full of the motions of concupiscence, so unguarded in thy outward senses, so often entangled with many vain imaginations, so much inclined to things exterior, so negligent of the interior, so prone to laughter and dissipation, so hard to tears and compunction, so inclined to relaxation and to the pleasures of the flesh, so sluggish in austerity and fervor, so curious to hear news and see fine things, so remiss to embrace humiliation and abjection, so covetous to possess much, so sparing in giving, so close in retaining, so inconsiderate in talking, so unobservant in silence, so disordered in thy manners, so overeager in thine actions, so immoderate in food, so deaf to the word of God, so ready for repose, so slow to labor, so wakeful to hear idle tales, so drowsy at the sacred vigils, so hasty to finish thy devotions, so wandering in attention, so dry in communicating, so quickly distracted, so seldom fully recollected, so suddenly moved to anger, so apt to take offense at others, so prone to judge, so severe in reprehending, so joyful in prosperity, so weak in adversity, so often proposing many good things and bringing them so little to effect. If there is one thing we can do to reverse all these true, too true statements, I would say it is devout meditation, frequent meditation on the passion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.